welcome to Solving Climate Change Once and For All. I'm Bi Huye, and thanks so much for joining this online series where we're talking to experts and entrepreneurs to learn what from their work we can apply to climate action and more importantly to climate justice. You'll leave with the one key thing you can do to make a positive impact. Today we're in for a real treat and we're lucky to be joined by a serial entrepreneur no nonsense thought leader and author Jigger Shah. And this Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's so great to have you. Jigger, I mean, a lot of people know your background, but for those who don't, Jigger founded Sun Edison and this pioneering idea of no money down solar or what we've come to know as solar as a service, which has been used to finance over $1 trillion in clean energy assets today. He served as the founding CEO of the Carbon War Room, which helps entrepreneurs address climate change all over the world. And today he's leading his latest venture, Generate Capital, which as the namesake implies, is opening up the floodgates for billions of dollars of investment in critical and innovative resource infrastructure. His views are different than some of the other speakers that we've been interviewing in this series. So I hope you're all ready for this dialogue. Hello and welcome again, Jigger. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome to have you. So you've led groundbreaking work in climate action for decades, and you seem to have it all figured out. Can you take us back to the day you started this journey? You know, what was 12-year-old Jigger like? <laughs> well, there's definitely some Facebook photos going around right now around uh, what your high school year was photos are and my dad so uh, 12 year 12, 12 year old year was off but yeah no I, I learned about solar power when I was 16 and I've been you know I don't know that I knew much about climate change back then I'm pretty sure I didn't I'm not really sure I knew much about climate change really until I went and worked at BP uh, where Lord John Brown had really talked about um, you know climate change being real and that we need to do something about it which was, you know, sort of 98, 99. And then, um, then yeah, when I, you know, went to join Sun Edison, uh, sort, shortly thereafter, I was uh, asked to join the Greenpeace board, and that's probably where I learned a lot about climate change. Hey, I'll have to scour Facebook for some of those pictures. And I, I love this starting <laughs> point you share. Um, doing work in BP, that resonates with me having started my career at another large energy company, Chevron. And I think for me, it was driven by this perhaps naive optimism that if you want to see big change, it should be at scale and you can target kind of the largest impact uh, origin points, right? Energy enterprise being that for me. So what motivated you to take the leap of faith from working within industry to creating your own companies? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I thought BP was great and the people I met there were fantastic, I think. But in general, as you know, um, to move the needle of places like that, you really need to be at billion dollar scale. And, um, and there were a lot of things that we were cooking up in the solar group and the clean energy group that, you know, were really at five million dollars or ten million dollars scale and you know, uh, those projects to get done was to really leave and to focus on those projects um, and you know BP was always really good to me and we partnered with BP solar after I left and so it was always a good um, partnership but but it became pretty apparent that I couldn't innovate within the company Right. And I think for me, a similar realization is it's really helpful to know a paradigm in order to break a paradigm. And we channel that into the innovation that we want to see, the gaps that we want to close. And everybody in the industry saw you do this with your no money down solar concept, right? For those not in the industry, a power purchase agreement or a PPA where you can buy the service of clean energy without having to buy the infrastructure or own the whole power plant. That was revolutionary. It's the Spotify or Netflix of solar. So having worked with these big players, with venture capital, with utilities, big oil, what are some of the other paradigms that need to be challenged for more climate action? Well, clearly one of the big ones that we're faced with is government. Right. And, you know, the way in which we've systematically set up the rules in government has led to a lot of um, 
you know, uh, decisions that were not necessarily proactively made, but just backed into. And I think if the government were sending different signals, then utilities would operate differently. Mm -hmm. And you talk a lot about resource efficiency. I think that's an interesting concept. Could you unpack that a little bit for our listeners, you know, related to this concept of what's the paradigm that we need to bust? Yeah, I mean, in general, I think the paradigm that we're all used to is one that allows you to spend energy freely and live a more modern lifestyle, right? Beyond, sort of, whether it's jet fuel for aviation or electricity for, you know, sending you in an elevator 24 floors up, you know, in a, in a vertical building, right? I mean, all of these things are modern conveniences that we're used to having. And I don't think people are looking to sacrifice their way to solving climate change. So, so the question really becomes, you know, how do we accommodate more environmentally friendly energy sources? How do we accommodate more um, eco-friendly approaches to um, living in harmony with nature while still being able to live a modern lifestyle? And, you know, the jury's still out. I certainly am very confident that we can do it. But, I mean, there are some people who think that it's not possible. But either way, resource efficiency has to be part of it, right? I mean, no matter what um, resources we're talking about, whether it's water or, you know, soil or, um, or air or, um, you know, others, you know, we, we have to figure out how to do more with less. Definitely. And I think that what's so powerful about this concept of resource efficiency also is that it includes humans it's not just an environmental problem. It's not just about the limit of resources themselves. It's about our use of them and, and how we want to do that sustainably. And that sort of brings me to the central topic of this series, something I've noticed for essentially my whole career that's been sort of overlooked, right? Climate justice. You know, where is the people dimension of the solutions that we're designing, developing, implementing into the marketplace? Um, not just for those who are gainfully employed or have high income or have access to resources, but for everyone, because we're not really solving climate change if you're not solving it for people at the fringes who are affected first and worst. So how do you define climate justice and why do you think it's so easily ignored? Well, I'd start with environmental justice and then we certainly can move to climate justice. Really, people who have been forced to, you know, live near uh, coal plants and, you know, lots of other places which give them much higher, you know, negative health impacts, right? So African-American children have 10 times the asthma rates as white children, for instance. And so, um, you know, to me, I think if climate justice starts with environmental justice and then moves to climate justice where you're talking about people who are going to be displaced uh, based on sea level rise, et cetera, are probably going to be people in those same communities who you know, are living in low-lying areas that flood more easily, et cetera, right? And so, um, so that's, that's probably my definition of, um, you know, uh, climate justice. Do you have a, an opinion on why it's so easily ignored by, you know, governments, institutions, kind of the companies that hold more resources that could make an impact here? Well, I, you know, I think that, that when you look at these um, these communities, in general, I'd say that they have been disenfranchised, obviously, from their voice or their vote. And I think that in general, um, it is the agreement of government to solve the problem, right? Figuring out how to get private corporations to solve it, I think, is a fool's errand. And you can certainly try and beat up some of the corporations that are the worst offenders. But in general, this is about how government figures out how to solve these problems. We certainly have laws in the books around, you know, Environmental Protection Agency and other things to actually solve these issues, but but we actually need government to step up and businesses, of course, to support them um, to, to make changes at scale um, to be able to, to achieve these problems. Right? Remember, you know, when we were solving the, the problems with the California solar industry, it could have been the case that we actually said that you know, we're providing this, you know, extra rebate adder for, you know, people that live in climate climate justice zones, right, or environmental justice zones, right? But we never bothered to do that. Um, and, you know, we did add an extra 4% uh, 
for you know climate justice and environmental justice, but they didn't use that money for that. Um, and so there's just a lot of missed opportunities, I'd say, in these areas. I mean, you know, there's a lot of um, of good ideas out there that, you know, frankly, just haven't been implemented at scale. So when you think about like grid alternatives, I think still doesn't use um, tax equity well in the way it supports its its customers, right? And so, um, which is it's a great organization, and I think it's trained thousands of um, of people uh, from these communities to work in the solar industry. But they could have probably, you know, stretched their money a third farther if they learned how to use tax equity well. Um, and it's not for a lack of trying that people haven't tried to do that. I mean, the same thing's true with um, uh, home health care workers who have for a long time, you know, um, uh, been underpaid but have to drive around a lot to visit their clients. And, you know, electric vehicles are actually a far cheaper and more dependable way of getting folks to work. And when you talk to people in the home health care industry, they just don't want to hear about how to support those folks with that, even though it actually negatively impacts them if someone's car breaks down and they can't get to a job on time. And so I think a lot of that stuff needs a lot of, you know, government heavy handedness. Otherwise, you're not going to see big solutions in that area. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I think a lot of people in this industry are guilty, me included, of feeling like this is action I need to take. This is behavioral change. This is, you know, within my sphere of influence, what can I do to make a difference? And it really is about for scale, um, for scalable impact to see government really step in and figure out what do we need to solve for. I think in terms of your sphere of influence with Generate Capital, you've made the point, you know, businesses can only do so much um, within the rules of the game that are written by government. Can you share where climate justice falls within Generate Capital's priorities and um, what from the government you need to allow you to do more of this work? Yeah, so we don't define our sectors, you know, uh, by climate justice. And so we define our sectors by technology or by risk profile or things like that. Um, but we certainly get climate justice deals that come in every once in a while. We just don't get a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that the ones that we do get in um, are generally poorly formed and, you know, may only need like a million dollars of financing, which is too small for us. And so I think part of the way you solve this problem is figuring out how to get more and better deal flow in the climate justice space. And then I think, you know, generate like many others would fund them. It's really more about figuring out how to get more deal flow. Can you give a few examples of projects that have been pitched that fit more in that sort of the parameters for climate justice or even ones that you've pushed, you know, that you've shared with me that weren't really uh, adopted and, and sort of the mindset of why they weren't pushed further? Well, I mean, you know, Posigen has been really interesting, right? Posigen has been talking to these communities for years and saying, look, you know, we're going to put in solar, but we're also going to do energy efficiency and we're going to do all the energy efficiency that actually has like two year paybacks. And so your savings are going to be at least 50 bucks a month. And that's made people far more excited about the product than they were before. But, you know, but Posigen is a small part of the entire residential solar marketplace. And the vast majority of other people that have tried to do this kind of thing, whether it's Solar City, when they bought an energy efficiency company and tried to blend the two together, has had you know a real struggle, and I think that much should be expected from these companies and these industries, including solar and wind and energy efficiency and others. But I think a lot needs to be expected from the communities themselves, where there's a reasonable deal that's struck. Because right now, I think in general, it's it's a pretty toxic situation, and I think that you know what happens is companies who are well-meaning trying to get involved in the situation end up, you know, with a bloody nose and, and a little reputation that, you know, is not something that they, you know, bargain for, right? And so then it ends up in a situation where, you know, it's, it's almost better not to engage sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talk with Bill Weil, who has founded Climate Voice, and it's all about safe activism um, for employees and, and future employees of companies to be able to take a stance safely around what they expect companies to do. 
and also with Joel McCower, who uh, gives us this insight around how do you encourage companies to take action um, without making them afraid that any action they take will actually reveal the weaknesses or gaps in the other strategies that they're doing. So um, some teasers there to other interviews in this series. And I think what you're touching on is really key that we do have to shift our mindset. It, it can be economically viable in addition to being socially impactful. I mean, communities today in these areas are paying far higher costs for electricity than wealthy people because of the fixed charges, right? They actually have far higher costs for transportation because much of it's unreliable, right? And um, so electric vehicles are actually far cheaper on a cost per month for a lot of these communities. Um, you know, AAA actually says the average car now costs $800 a month uh, for people all in uh, with maintenance. And you know, electric vehicles are, you know, today at two, three, four hundred dollars $400 a month. Um, so I think there's actually a lot of ways to deal with climate justice. But it's not generally been dealt with in a straightforward manner. And the way in which the community problems getting solved are generally not conducive with how business can operate. That's a huge disconnect for sure, that the way in which we can solve for it is not the way in which it's being incentivized, right? And I think that's why your worldview, your value proposition about how do we bring capital um, to these types of solutions is so critical to unlock more of the work that we want to see that's about climate justice rather than just technologies or, um, you know, project financing mechanisms. I think to play devil's advocate a little bit, um, you know, some companies, some private equity firms, some venture capitalists, the people in finance that are able to create these channels of investment to the solutions that we know we need might say, well, there isn't a high enough return or there isn't enough time or my team isn't big enough to really dedicate more of this work to those types of solutions. And that's what we know as a scarcity mindset. And I think it's sort of a yeah. paradigm that has held sustainability back because it comes from this origin point of do more with less. Do you see a possibility for us to shift that mindset to do better um, rather than always thinking about, you know, we have these constraints. How can we move to more of a regeneration mindset? Yeah, in general, I don't really think that that's like how this works, right? I mean, corporations are going to do what they do. And if they think they're going to make more money by you know, focusing on certain sectors or certain places, they're going to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And they may put money together in their foundations to, you know, support other initiatives, um, but they're not, they're not generally going to be like, oh yeah, let's be inclusive just because it makes us look better, right? And so mm -hmm. I don't think it's about like convincing businesses to help poor people, right? And oh, it's ESG, and we just want to make sure that we're being better citizens in our community. I mean, in general, we have systems for this, right? Electricity, uh, utilities, rate-based um, expenses, right? And so they can serve everybody. Like, you know, we have 12 million homes that didn't get uh, weatherized during the era of stimulus bill in 2009. Um, they could weatherize all those homes and rate-base it. Um, you know, they certainly allocated $700 million dollars during the public safety shutoffs in California to help poor people, um, you know, get higher than average rebates for battery storage so they can make it through um, better next time, mm -hmm. right? And so I just think that for whatever reason, everyone doesn't really acknowledge where all this money comes from. And, you know, and, and so then they don't really acknowledge exactly how this money gets spent, right? I mean, this money comes from infrastructure providers, right? electric utilities, water utilities, et cetera. And then they get regulated by the state. And right now the state says we want the lowest possible cost per unit, as opposed to saying we want to be able to serve all these customers in a way that you know, meets climate justice and environmental justice requirements, which may cost a little bit more, but it's the right thing to do. Um, but that's where that, that needs to go. And then the private corporations will do whatever the, um, the government regulators tell them to do. So the government regulars say, hey, you need to do this, or 
we're going to incentivize you to do this. Well, it'll be magical how everyone will easily, you know, move to doing that work. And I think in the time that we're filming this with the COVID-19 global pandemic, we're seeing that mobilization, right? That we can create, find resources, um, provide relief, think about healthcare being universal, and it's not magical. It is through the infrastructure and systems that have been set up that we're now kind of leveraging because we are demanding it. So that's a, that's a great point, fulcrum point for us to think about in terms of how we shift mindset and how we get people to act. Um, you've obviously seen a lot in your career and you aren't shy about telling it like it is. I'm curious, what's the most shocking thing you've learned in your work as related to climate justice? Well, I mean, you know, like I've, I've generally lived a pretty good life. So I don't know that there's been a lot of shocking things. But when I was on the board of Greenpeace, for instance, I, um, you know, Greenpeace had a huge uh, effort to, um, to shut down coal plants. And while Sierra Club was doing it sort of, you know, sort of uh, through the regulatory process, Greenpeace was doing it through climate justice communities. And they went to, you know, frontline community in Chicago that was living next to a coal plant that literally was in the south side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And while the reporter, um, sorry, the, the uh, anchor woman at the, the, the news program was reporting the story, mm -hmm. she literally started crying on TV mm -hmm. um, because these people had such terrible health impacts from living next to the coal plant. And I think that next day, Rahm Emanuel, the mayor of Chicago at the time, was forced to, uh, to, to negotiate a deal to shut down those coal plants. Right. And, and that, uh, to me, I think that is the power of, you know, Greenpeace, but also the power of climate justice as an issue. Right. I mean, I do think that these things can be done and they can change things. And it was a powerful moment in my life to see that occur. And it's, you know, catapulted me to do more work in this area. I'm on the board of Climate Hawks Vote, which, you know, is with other climate justice leaders and, you know, try to like, you know, get folks elected that, um, that care about climate justice issues. Right. And so I think we do what we can in this area, but the outcomes really come from government getting involved. The work we do obviously is hard. Um, you know, you're sharing some success stories and some great examples. And I'm sure along your career, you've gone through a lot of roller coaster high points and also kind of um, failures yourself in entrepreneurship. What's been your lowest moment that you can share with us? And how did you get past that? And then kind of continually derive hope for the future? Well, I mean, I've, I've certainly lived a life of, of many high moments. And so I certainly am not going to sugarcoat, um, you know, the fact that my life's been pretty good so far. But I think in terms of some low moments, uh, clearly, um, you know, when we were in the middle of, a financial crisis and gener and Sun Edison was about to go public. And, you know, we had, um, you know, a board who basically used that as an opportunity to crush the ownership stake of employees and, uh, and others. I mean, that was a pretty low point as somebody who had, you know, built the company. I really wanted the employees to be able to monetize all the stock options they received and, you know, worked pretty hard to make sure that we got through that situation in the best way that I could. Um, but I, in general, I'd say that, um, you know, I think that there are struggles where people do things that are deliberately outside of, you know, what is good policy. And those are also low points, right? I mean, so right now, for instance, with the EPA, you know, really just saying they're not going to, um, uh, you know, enforce environmental rules, you know, methane emissions are at an all time high. and you know, that's terrible, right? It makes, you know, climate change even worse. Um, and so I think there's a lot of places where, you know, I I certainly, you know, try to keep a positive attitude, but, but this is not an easy process for anybody. And I think figuring out how you uh, navigate, you know, whether it's investors or whether it's stakeholders or others. I mean, one of my, you know, good friends, um, you know, in her official position, you know, basically trying to shut down one of our facilities and, Michigan. And, you know, she's like, well, you're going to have to hire this lobbyist to basically convert 
some of the minds and hearts of folks in the legislature in order to keep the facility open. And it was processing food waste into renewable natural gas. But there were, you know, a bunch of people on Facebook who self-organized to convince themselves that, you know, that renewable natural gas caused cancer. And, um, you know, and it's just one of those things where it's a low point, but you, you work the problem, you work with the relationships and you try to figure out how to be a good citizen to, you know, to all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of our viewers and listeners, they want to be that good citizen. And, you know, we've promised them that they'll leave with this one key thing that they can do to join the fight, create positive impact, do what they can. How would you boil that down for people, individuals who want to do good work for climate justice? So I've said this to a lot of people. I mean, the the number one thing people can do, I mean, obviously, great. You know, if you can put solar panels in your house or buy an electric car or do all the things, you should do it. But the number one thing you can do is to talk to your elected officials. And I don't mean like Nancy Pelosi. I mean, obviously, if you know her and she's your best friend, feel free to talk to her. <laughs> I'm just talking about your county commissioner or your city council members. It's shocking to me, you know, I mean, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland, and um, our county commissioner is sort of left of Bernie Sanders. And, you know, I breakfast with him and I said, look, you know, you're the one who declared a climate emergency here and you're not doing anything about climate. And we went through this meeting and like, I think it was a like 45 minute meeting and like two hours in the meeting after I'm like yelling at him for two hours, Right. <laughs> Like, you know, we finally broke up and like his assistant like emailed me and said, you know what, like he actually really enjoyed that conversation and he enjoyed the kick in the ass and like actually here are like the five areas we'd love your help with. And I do think that we should expect more from our elected leaders, particularly the folks that you think are progressive who aren't doing anything. And it's, it's one of those things where I feel like climate justice is going to get solved because the government decides it actually wants to solve it right? Business can be a voice for good. People can be helpful. Philanthropists can give money. All that stuff is valuable. But the government is the one who actually has to solve the problem. And they're not going to prioritize it unless people actually hear from their constituents, particularly at the local level. I love how specific that is and to not shy away from conflict because sometimes that's what people want, obviously respectfully, to be able to understand how dire, urgent, and meaningful it is to make those changes, um, you know, rewrite the rules that we're all kind of working within. So in terms of the current situation while we're filming this, you know, COVID-19 global pandemic, do you have any insights as to how you engage in those very personal conversations at a time like this? Well, I mean, look, you have to be sensitive. I mean, they have bigger problems to deal with, but, but not for long. I mean, in a few weeks time, right? We're going to have one of the worst um, economic situations that we've, you know, ever experienced in the U.S.'s history, right? Probably rivaling the Great Depression. And um, the easiest way to get out from underneath this is to deal with climate justice and climate change issues. And, um, you know, we're the largest job creator since 2008, the Great Recession. We've, you know, hired more blue-collar folks, and we've hired more people of color and veterans and other folks and brought them into our industry. And so we should be required and, and incentivized to do more of that. But more than that, we should be getting on with it as soon as we're all let outside of this quarantine. So like, I, I don't think that, that we should be waiting much longer to have this conversation because, um, you know, time's a wasting. And, you know, as we saw with, with climate change, uh, emissions going down so fast during this COVID-19 response, um, we actually can solve climate change pretty quickly if everyone got to it and put their mind to it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's incredible how fast we've mobilized around an also invisible sort of threat, but one that feels a lot more uh, present than maybe climate change that people can say, oh, the time scale is decades, decades long versus today. Um, You've obviously had the benefit of thinking very deeply about these issues. And I'm curious what you would say everybody is missing. You know, you're a thought leader in this space. What's something we're all overlooking that we need to spend more time on? The thing that I find, you know, that the COVID-19 crisis is really highlighting, but, you know, I think has been highlighted before, is just how dependent we are on each other. 
right? I mean, like, you know, I have to homeschool my kid right now and I'm terrible at homeschooling, right? <laughs> like I would love my kid to go back to a teacher's class, right? I mean, for folks who have cleaning people or folks who go to the grocery store and don't even look at the people who work at the grocery store, right, in the eye, or, you know, folks who, you know, know nurses and doctors and go, oh, yeah, they've got a profession that pays well. Um, like, in general, I think that we're just very dependent on each other. And we should remember that, that, like, that when we talk about who gets affected by climate justice and who gets affected by environmental justice issues. These are people that we interact with on a regular basis. They just have to travel 45 minutes, you know, away to get to the store or restaurant or other place that you attend and you go to, right? And they're suffering from increased rates of asthma, increased rates of heart disease and other things because of uh, pollution. And then we can do something about it. In fact, we are, we are doing something about it right now with the COVID-19 response. And so we shouldn't forget how that, you know, how dependent we are on each other and how important it is for us to actually look out for our, you know, fellow citizens and fellow human beings. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's such an important message about humanizing the problem and remembering who it is that's being impacted and, and our role in that and how we can help. Um, as someone who's been helping by giving this innovation to the industry for decades now. What success look like for you? What success look like for Generate Capital? What's that kind of milepost that you guys are working towards? Well, I mean, you know, Generate Capital obviously measures success and I measure success in many ways. I mean, just talk about Generate first, we obviously you know, first and foremost had to figure out whether this model even worked and you know, provided shareholder returns, which we have now done and been able to convince large infrastructure investors to come in. But now the next stage is actually trying to figure out, you know, where do we fit in within the ecosystem? And, you know, there are a lot of change makers out there who actually are just so focused on their technology that they don't know how to get their technology into the marketplace. So they're really good at raising corporate capital and, you know, raising rounds of finance because they're great, you know, uh, PowerPoint present presenters. But getting revenue is hard, right? And figuring out how you interact with this new asset class is obviously easy for solar and wind people. But for folks that are doing wastewater treatment or electric vehicles or all that stuff, they don't think about this as common knowledge. And the reason it matters so much is once they do, then generally it won't be by itself. We'll have 50 competitors in this space and it'll make the entire marketplace a much healthier one, um, which I look forward to, right? I mean... And I would say for me personally, right, what I want to accomplish in my life is to help empower people to, you know, be able to achieve the changes that are positive in the world that they want to achieve, right? I mean, the, the, the part that frustrates me the most is when we have all this history, right? You know, his, people who don't read, you know, history are doomed to repeat it. Um, and people, you know, don't actually spend the time to think through how do systems work? How have these systems been hacked in the past? Who has successfully hacked them? How do you actually make these changes? And, and, you know, so I try really hard to explain it to people who don't want to read the books themselves and, you know, want the cliff notes, but, but you kind of have to do some of the reading yourself and you have to like really think through like, you know, if I want to make these changes, for instance, like, is it best to just, you know, rely on, high net worth Silicon Valley, you know, tech entrepreneurs to fund my nonprofit, right? Or is it better to go out to, you know, the, um, they call it the mass uh, wealthy, I think, or the, uh, the mass affluent, right? People who are, you have a million dollars of net worth without their house, uh, credit investors. There's like 3.4 million families that have that, right? It's a lot of work to go talk to 3.4 million families. But it's also a lot better because your funding model is more secure and you actually make more change. And more people are talking about your nonprofit, right? Than just getting one person to give you $20 million. Um, and so it's just one of those things where I try really hard to help people realize that your dreams and you know what you want to accomplish are things that you can accomplish, but you can do it the easy way or you can do it the hard way. And you know it is actually not that hard to find the easy way. Um, if you're willing to do some research. I think that's an amazing call to action and also thanks for uncovering 
the sort of different places that may have been overlooked that are seemingly obvious, but not so when you are stuck again in that mindset of, we need this, so can you give it to us for free or can you donate it versus let's leverage this model that you're creating for us in terms of make it irresistible, make it a really good business decision for everybody to clamor to bring clean energy, um, better infrastructure, resource infrastructure to the market. So thanks so much for sharing your awesome insights. Um, really appreciate your kind of straightforward approach to figuring this out and giving all of our viewers uh, really good actionable tips to get active, talk to local officials, and kind of keep the hope up in terms of the better society we can create. My pleasure. This is great. Thank you for all the work you're doing.